everyone. Welcome. So before we get started, Third Place Books would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the Duwamish people and the land itself. So welcome to our virtual event space. My name is Ali. I am a bookseller at our Lake Forest Park location, and I'm your host for this evening. I am so excited to be introducing Cherie Priest and Jillian Venters here to discuss Cherie's book, Grave Reservations. But before we get into the good stuff, on behalf of all of us here at Third Place Books, I just want to quickly thank you all so very much for tuning in. For those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area. And as much as we miss having these events in our bookstores, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in. All three of our locations are open, or you can place an order online and come pick them up in the store. Or if you're not local, we of course ship. So if you'd like to get your hands on a copy of the book, and you, uh, if you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and follow the link. I will be posting in chat here very shortly. Uh, while you're over on the website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the next few months. And if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs. And of course, you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. Speaking of social media, if you'd like to check out some of our past virtual events, you can find most of them on our YouTube channel, including this event in the next couple of days. So if you'd like to see our other events or share this one, go ahead and track us down over there. Uh, this evening, we are here for about an hour, and towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which I can see people have already discovered. Welcome. The chat box is great for connecting with each other. We always love to hear from you, but when it comes time for questions, definitely make sure those end up in the Q&A. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone of our commitment to ensuring the safety and well-being of event attendees and guest authors. So in our chat and question spaces, please do lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. There are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of your screen. Select the live transcript button to enable or disable them. And finally, should any technical issues arise, which it could happen in the land of Zoom, uh, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them and we appreciate your patience and understanding. Alrighty, so I think that that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce Sherry Priest, the author of two dozen books and novellas, including the horror novel, The Toll, acclaimed Gothic Maple Croft, and the award-winning Clockwork Century series, which begins with Bone Shaker. Uh, she has been nominated for the Hugo Award and the Nebula Award. She has won the Locus Award for Best Horror Novel, in her newest novel, Grave Reservations, a travel agent slash inconsistent psychic and a Seattle PD detective team up to solve a murder. And oh, yes, look at the cover. It's so good. <laughs> Joining us in conversation this evening, I am so pleased to welcome Jillian Venters, the Lady of the Manners, creator of the wonderful blog Gothic Charm School and the book of the same name where she offers the quintessential guide to dark decorum for goths of all ages and for the family and friends who may not understand them. So thank you both so much for being here. I am so excited to listen in on this conversation. If you need anything, of course, give me a shout. I will be listening. Same goes for all of you in the chat. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass the stage to our authors. So welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and she vanished. Okay. She vanished. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sherry. Hi, oh, my Jillian. God. I know. I haven't seen you in 
person in like two years now, at least. Something like yeah. that. Yeah, which is no good. And, and for those who don't know, Sherry and I also live in the same sort of area. So yeah. back in the before times, we used to get together with other author friends and, and hang out and have sugary treats and alcohol. And I, yes, I, I don't know if you can see in the color. This is pink gin. This is some sort of like jasmine rose gin. And it is amazing. So. I might actually drink that. I, I don't do gin. There was a gin event many, many years ago. And now we do I rum. Just didn't, I didn't do gin until like a friend of mine introduced me to real gin. And I'm like, oh, it doesn't all taste like trees. That's cool. Okay. Yeah, I, it just, it's like pine salt to me. Mm -hmm. Understandable. Especially when it's coming back up. <laughs> uh, ooh. So, um, anyway. Anyway. Well, look, graduate school was a weird time. I No, I get it. I, I majored in music. Yeah, college was mm -hmm. weird. Yeah. Seattle in the 90s. It's a thing. Which is why I love, <laughs> let me segue, I love Grave Reservation so much because I knew every location. I knew every location. I'm like, I know where that is. I know what club that's supposed to be based on. So it was super cute. And as, as something in the supernatural mystery category, it, it was just charming as hell. I, I knew exactly who those characters were. I completely just adored them. So I know in your Afterward, you said you had decided you wanted to write something fluffier and less like, you know, yeah. end of the world. And then like the, there was, we, we had like, it, it was a tough handful of years, like kind of for me personally, in general, we had a cross country move. Uh, we, we lost a, a roommate we'd had for 20 years and yes, she was just a cat, but still uh, like, like, yeah, I know, right at like the same time. And, and we had a lot of trouble with our last house and then we had to move again. And, and then there was this election and uh, just kind of the whole world felt like it was burning down every single day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I basically stopped writing for a while. I, I had some contract stuff I had to finish up and, and some stuff that was kind of uh, ghost written that, that you, no one can ask me about it. I can't talk about it. Oh, right, but, right. But very stressful projects and, and just everything kind of seemed like a mess. And for a hot second there, I actually considered digging my degree back out and going back to teaching or something. Uh, it, it had been that bad for a bit. And uh, when we first got back to Seattle, and, and think we were really kind of struggling for a bit. And one of the things I discovered that sort of made things better uh, was the TV show Psych. I had never seen it before, and I binged all, what, like eight seasons, nine seasons, and the two movies at this point. <laughs> Loved them. And it's like, this is not complicated puzzle solving. Right. It's, th these are fun characters who you would like to hang out with and uh, are probably a blast to sit in the room with and just chat. And um, like, this is what's making me feel better. This is, this, this is comfort watching for me. And, and shows like um, iZombie and Lucifer and uh, kind of the, the it, it, you know, like e even the darker, more paranormal stuff, like it, the emphasis was on the characters and the relationships and the fun of it. And the stakes, well, I mean, except in Lucifer where sometimes, you know, the universe is going to end. Right. But, but generally the stakes aren't very high. Mm -hmm. And somebody just mentioned Ghost on CBS. Dude, I binged the entire BBC one before this one started and I loved it. It was one of my favorite things, even though I griped about it endlessly. Because... And something that I think CBS is actually, okay, look, 99 times out of 100, I will stand for whatever the BBC does first. This is the one time where I'm like, Jesus Christ, these people are stupid. How are people this stupid alive? <laughs> like, how have they not tripped and fallen into traffic? You know, I, I don't understand. Like, any given circumstance where there is any decision to be made in the BBC version, the nice young couple... Uh, we'll choose the worst, the worst possible thing that no one in their right mind would ever do. And, and it got really cringy sometimes. And, and I had a little, little, just because I, I don't like cringe humor. I find it really hard. It, yeah. Uh, but the CBS version with Rosem Carver, again, I zombie, loved that as well. Even though I had a bunch of people emailing me like, hey, they built a wall around Seattle and filled it with zombies. They owe you like residuals and I'm like yeah let me get right on that yeah sure um yeah what am I gonna do uh, they should probably talk to Diana Rowland first in her white trash zombie series that had a coroner who was a zombie who oh. used her office to eat brains oh oh yeah happy they, hour of the damned no no no, no. That, was, that was Mark Henry uh, that white was Mark okay zombie. right uh, right right okay. yeah Rowland I'm sorry not Rowland uh yeah anyway it was just it was it was my train of thought is totally derailed oh ghosts I was talking about ghosts 
listen, I work from home by myself and I have people to talk to. So I'm just like, just, just point me in a direction and I'll ramble. But, but it, so the CBS one with, with Rose and, and some different guy, they come off more naive perhaps, uh, but not stupid. And she's already had, they've already had a couple of conversations that I was kept yelling at the BBC one to just say yeah. these things out just loud. Talk, just talk. And I, and I hate stuff where like a simple conversation would clear everything up right now, you know, nope, right. drives me insane. But, uh, you know, this is CBS so far. And, and one thing that I've noticed is that the CBS show is paced a lot faster. Mm. It's just two seasons of the BBC one. And um, honestly, I stuck around for that one, for the ghost as much as anything, because the cast is, I, I, I came to care about and worry about the nice young couple. Uh, but I, I was really there for the ghost. And uh, in, in, the, in the CBS one, I actually feel a little bit better about rooting for the nice young couple and not kind of hoping that they'll just die in a ditch because they're too stupid to climb out. I, you know, and maybe that's unkind, but that's how I feel. And my feelings are valid. They are. <laughs> they are. But yeah, no, I, I, I'm genuinely will use it. Hannibal as comfort media. Yeah. <laughs> well, Hannibal is beautiful. Give me my emotional support, Cannibal. Mm -hmm. That is what I need. Yeah. I would, but, I would give you one if I had one. I, I appreciate that. Oh, so that's what all got you to write? Write yeah. Grave Reservations? Oh, yeah, that was the question. Um, <laughs> I've been no, running no, Zoom meetings all day for work, so I am really, I am good at being focused I right now. appreciate that because focus is not my strong suit under the <laughs> best of circumstances. And this has been a month over here. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, no, it kind of a lot of people talk about when it comes to writing like you're the pantsers or the plasters you know you do it by the seat of your pants or you're you're or you're an architect or a gardener you know and you mm -hmm. plan everything out or you just sort of let it grow and see where it goes I don't really do any of that um for me it's always been more like uh Katamari Demancy where like here's an idea it'll stick to this idea and then there's a third idea and then a fourth idea and a fifth idea and eventually you kind of have this big ball of idea that you can roll around and, and, and fiddle with and shape until it, it's the size of a book. That's and a so, great description. Well, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> uh, my doc, listen, I promised people on Twitter that you I would promised. show them this. You promised. This is oh. the scenario behind me. Oh. Hey, Grayson. What oh. you doing, bud? Did you? <laughs> I know it's dark in here. I'm sorry. I don't have my overhead. is not very bright. But uh, that's Grayson and his kitty. And uh, so good. They are. So, oh, he is. He's the best boy. But uh, I'm afraid the cat's actually about to get up and leave. So I felt like I should probably do that <laughs> while I still have them right there. Uh, no, but but for great reservation, the the ideas that stuck together there were there were several of them. So I I have back trouble and I spent all day hauling brush, and um so I sit with my feet up. Um, pardon me. Uh. So there were several, and one was the idea that I wanted to do something lighter, something more like psych, something with gentle puzzles, fairly low stakes. I mean, sure, there's murders, but you don't really know any of the murdered people, and you don't really care about them. They're kind of not the point. Um, the point is watching Lassiter get yelled at all the time. That's half the fun yeah. in psych. But uh, you know, so, so it was like, okay, well, I want to do something a little lighter, and I, and I grew up on mysteries. I love mysteries. Mysteries have always been my chiefest jam. Uh, my reading was really tightly restricted when I was young. Uh, we lived with my mother, my sister, and I for a long time, and uh, she was very evangelical. Oh, no yeah. sneaking off for the Stephen King books for you? No, 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 no. In fact, uh, one, because my dad figured out pretty young that I really liked mystery, so he thought, well, you know, age-appropriate, how about some Nancy Drew? And he went to the library, and we checked them out, and I was very excited about it. My mother threw them away and made me pay the library back out of my allowance because I should have known better than to invite the presence of Satan into her home. And I would like to say that I was joking. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not joking. This, this is actually a thing that happened. Um, so I learned to get sneaky. Right. And uh, my mom had like, the only fiction we were allowed to have was either literature or Christian fiction. And uh, Christian fiction at the time, because I was born in 75. So in the eighties, there was this huge trend in Christian fiction where it was, you know, blonde haired, blue eyed pioneer lady is saved from being raped by the godless savages oh, because of her faith in Jesus. There was a, that, there was a trend of that like oh, in the it was century insane. too. So yeah, it was at the turn of the, the previous. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. 
you know, so my mom thought that was perfectly suitable reading for an eight-year-old, uh, but uh, not Nancy Drew and not Scooby-Doo, certainly, and nothing scary. Uh, but luckily, my mother's definition of literature was, is the author dead? So my dad figures out this is a huge workaround. So he starts like just pumping me full of like Edgar Allan Poe and Sherlock Holmes. And, and then when I was like 13 or 14, I don't remember, I, I was a teenager, but a, low, a level one teenager basically. Um, he sneaks me a Lovecraft compendium and I didn't know who Lovecraft was. I had no frame of reference for any of this. And my dad's a big old nerd, I mean, even now. <laughs> so he knew. <laughs> so he gives it to me and my mom is like well now I don't know who this is I'm not familiar with this author what's, what's the situation here and my dad's like oh uh Lovecraft he was writing in uh in the 1920s like uh Fitzgerald and uh Hemingway and those guys and my mom like if, if she's not interested in it she won't even look at it so she didn't even open it and she just goes Oh, well, they weren't writing bad things in the 1920s. That's probably fine. Handed me the book and walked away. So, okay. That was like my nerd starter kit right there, pretty much. So, so, so my first experience with Lovecraft is my family is, is a family of chronic insomniacs. We just, we don't sleep at normal hours. So, I mean, same, my grandmother didn't, my dad doesn't, it came down to me. So at about eight years old, I am roaming around the, the house we are renting at like two in the morning going, okay, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. I've read all the books in my room. And my dad is awakened in the living room. So he sees me padding around and he's like, what? I'm like, I read all the books in my room. What do we have that I can read? So he hands me an H.P. Lovecraft anthology and says, here, go read this. I was like, okay, handing your insomniac eight-year-old child with an active imagination Lovecraft and having her read Pickman's model as her very first Lovecraft story, there is a reason why specific genres of horror freak me out to this day. I'm like, what do you mean the boundaries of reality are kind of permeable and maybe that stuff's real? I think mine was The Rats in the Walls. I think oh. that was the first story in the collection. And, um, Oh boy, like I, yeah. I remember that one really vividly. But, but I think after, oh yeah, well there goes Grace. Oh, hang on, let me help him with the door. Just sec. Grace, hang on, buddy. Hang on, bud. There you go, Lucy. Do you want to come in? What are we doing, guys? You want to come in? Well, I'll leave it cracked. I have a menagerie. In fact, come here, kiddo. I have a kitty. <laughs> Quinny, you used to be so tiny. You were this tiny handful. Oh, she weighed a pound. I know. I remember it out around 20. I remember all of us saying when you found the kitten that we're like, oh, congratulations, you have a kitten now. And you're like, no, I didn't find her. No, she's the funny noise a friend's car was making. They pulled over uh, after like 12 miles and uh, popped the hood. Shit, sorry. I'm sorry. My, my office is in disarray right now and nothing is really where it should be. And I'm making a mess here. Uh, and they knew we'd fostered and they weren't cat people. And they just kind of showed up and were like, here you go. And she weighed 1.12 pounds, sitting in the palm of my hand. My husband saw the photos on Twitter before I did. So <laughs> Pete came downstairs and he's like, what? Here he's gotten a new kitten. I'm like, really? He's like, well, it's going to be her kitten. I'm like, oh, oh my God. All right, all right. Lucy, come here, Luce. <gasps> Lucy. Lucy. And she's wandering out. Luce, Luce, come here. And everybody's wet because they just got their walk. Hey, put your face up. There's, oh, there's the face. There's the my face. Girl. That's my girl. Oh, she's a good girl. Yay. <laughs> make the yeah. face, Lucy. Make the face. Like all of Lucy's faces are, are face making. Even yep. Oh, see. yes. The dog. That, yes. And they're soaked because they just got back from their walk. <laughs> what do you, can I help you with something? I'm in the middle of something. Is she just wagging her tail real gentle at me? Like she expects a response. And like, oh, okay, well, now she's leaving. So that's why. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so you decided to write this. This I did. And, and here are the things that went into it. So first was the idea I wanted to do something a little lighter. Second was the idea of a mystery because I really loved mysteries. I grew up on Dash Hammett and Agatha Christie because they were dead. They were fair game. And my mother didn't really care because they were so, I, she had in her head this idea that if it's really old, then it was sanitized probably. Um, I, but uh, she doesn't think very hard about these things. Uh, so anyway, I grew up on those and Doyle and, and Holmes and, 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 and all of that. I'm like, all right, I can do a mystery. And, and when I got into Wild Cards, I guess about 10 years ago, when George invited me into that, uh, my first pitch was a, reti a retiring cop uh, named Leo. 
He's in New York, they make you retire at 61, 62, something like that. But he has this one last case that has haunted him all these years. <laughs> so they put that together. And so I, I learned how to assemble a mystery rather than just consume them, uh, honestly working for him, for those. And I, I did, so right before I started working on this, I finished a piece for him that was kind of messy. So, so uh, if you're not familiar with George R. R. Martin's uh, wild card series, I know that his song Wife of Fire is, is a big deal, but he does a superhero series that's been running for like 30 years. And uh, I- I love it. It is- I'm still not entirely sure how I got wrapped up in it. I, I have my suspicions as to who pointed them at me, but um, it, it, it's it's, it's really complicated and it's been going on for a really long time and there's like 35 40 people who contributed to it at this point some of whom are now dead uh some of whom uh, moved on to other careers and don't but there's all this canon that's established so they were re-releasing one of the older books and he asked me if I would write an interstitial because it was really like three separate subplots that don't really touch very much and so he's like for this book would you write something kind of connecting all of these uh, let's use your cop. He would have been a young man when this book came out. He would have been a new detective. Uh, let's talk about his partner, who you mentioned in the later books. And uh, okay, okay, okay. But it meant taking three sets of stories that I didn't write, and I can't change anything in them because they were already published. Which book and is it? Joker Down Shuffle. Oh, okay. I, I have one. I have read most of the the wild cards. Yeah. Ones, so yeah. Yeah. He, he he's adding new material as they were being re released through oh. uh, Tor. Okay. And for some of these re-releases, because a lot of the old books are out of print, and he's trying to bring them back around. And uh, so I wrote the interstitial for that. It's about 25,000 words, but it was a struggle. I, I mean, just like, okay, so he's got to touch all of these cases. He can't actually change anything about any of these cases. He can't solve any of these cases. Right. Uh, so I, I had to comb through them and look for loose ends that aren't addressed. And there, there were several. There were just enough to hang a story on but if you read the whole thing straight it wouldn't have made a lot of sense because it references a lot of stuff that you know what I mean it's like kind of removing it from the context to read uh which really confused the first copy editor on that oh yeah I had to send it back to him like George I don't think she knows that this yeah. is part of a larger whole she's very confused um, but anyway, after that, because I was real concerned about it, I'm like, man, I, I honestly don't know if I'm up to this particular task. I've only done two mysteries ever. Mm -hmm. I did the rat race for Fort Freak. That was my first one. That was Leo in his case. And then I did a shorter novelette for Mississippi Roll. That's all I had done mystery-wise ever. And I just felt like this was a huge ask that I really wanted, like, if there's anybody in the world I want to impress, I mean, come on. So I like did my best. I handed in and... I'm sure to the eternal ire of people who are waiting for the last song of Ice and Fire book, he turned around in like an hour and had notes for me on this 25,000 word thing. But it, they were really minor. And at the end of it, he just had one line. He said, now you know how to write a mystery, go do one. Oh, that's like, great encouragement. Oh my God. I was like, God. well, shit, if, if George thinks I can do it, I should take a swing at this. Right? So, I, so that collided with lighter collided with um, an old memory from when we lived in Seattle the first time. There used to be downtown an import shop, like an antique import place called Farfetched. Yes. It was down like near the uh, square, the, the Mercer yeah. Mess. Yeah, yeah, it was down. There. Yeah, it was down. Like off at a block, but you could see the sign from the triangle. Yes. And every time I saw it, it's like, man, that's a great name. That's a great name for an import store or for, and it's just like, man, you could, you could call all kinds of stuff that you could call, you know, this or this or this. And a travel agency kind of popped to mind, like, ah, oh, hmm, that'd be great. And then those things collided with something that happened to me, oh God, at this point, it would have been seven or eight years ago. And I told the full story last night. I know there's a couple of people who tuned in last night, so I'll, I'll give you the annotated version. I was doing an event in Texas. <clears throat> we're actually grew, I, I spent a long time growing up on the Gulf Coast in Southeast Texas in Florida so this is in Galveston where I used to go all the time as a kid and I was like yeah I'll go to this event but it's January there's a storm coming up in the Gulf it's not going to be a hurricane it's not warm enough for that but the storm was going to I mean just torpedo the entire southeast and we were living in Chattanooga at the time so I leave this event everybody's fleeing to get to the airport because we know it's coming and it's going to dump a shit ton of snow and the Southeast is every bit as bad as the Pacific Northwest about. 
I'm in the car headed to the airport and I get a text message. Hi, I'm your travel agent. I was really hoping to catch you before you left. I changed your flight. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's like, what? No, just don't worry. Your new flight leaves 30 minutes later from the next gate oval. Uh, just with a storm coming in, I just had a bad feeling about the first one. And uh, here's your new confirmation number. Here's all your stuff. Uh, have a nice trip. And I'm like, well, okay, this seems pretty low touch. Because the thing is, from Galveston, because you got to fly out of Houston, it's like two hours, depending on traffic and, and the ferries and bridges and whatever else is going on. So I'm like, okay, I can use the extra time. That's fine. I get to the airport. And I remember it was American Airlines, which I no longer fly, although this story is not why. Um, there's a line of 187 people in the lobby. And I know that because I had time to stand there and count them because the desk is out for American Airlines. And I just kind of text her. So I was bored. I'm like, hey, listen, thanks for trying. But I, I think I'm probably going to be stuck in Texas tonight. I got family around Houston. It's no big deal. I'll make some phone calls. But, you know, thank you for trying. I do appreciate it. Do, 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 do. Use the kiosk. There's, there isn't a kiosk. Do, 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 do. And it's, oh, and look here. So I check it. Yeah, they're roped off. I, I don't think they work. Nobody's using them. And I remember what she replied exactly was nobody's using them because nobody's using them. Go try. So I do. They work fine. I tell the people who are behind me and there's a rush, but I am through and I've made it through security. I get past my first gate. Flight's canceled. She was right. So I get to the second gate. Flight's delayed 45 minutes. And all of you regular travelers know what that means. I'm like, shit, this one's going down too. Yeah. And I was standing there thinking, well, who do I still know, you know, here in Texas? Uh, you know, all right, I got some step cousins in the area. I got a couple of friends. I'll call around. Do 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 do. You're in Chattanooga, right? How close are you to Nashville? And I see where she's going, and I'm like, not as close as I am to Atlanta. Actually, I live at the south end of the city on the state line. I'm about 90 miles from Parkfield. If you can get me to Atlanta, I can rent a car and make it home the rest of the way. No big deal. I've done it before. I, I have done it many times because you, you get a puddle jumper to Chattanooga. It's a little tiny regional airport and the runways are too small to accommodate anything bigger. So you got to take a puddle jumper from somewhere. Right. And, and no kitty. No, we're not going in there. <laughs> I heard this pick, pick, pick noise. She's picking at my cabinet over here trying to open it because she's a cat. Um, so I was like, listen, if you can get me to Hartsfield. But she's like, no, I'm going to get you home tonight. And if you have to rent a car, you're not getting home tonight. You won't make it till tomorrow. So is there someone who could pick you up? And I'm like, well, shit, I don't want to ask my poor husband, but because the weather was about to turn terrible and we all knew it. But at the time we were driving this old BMW X5, we bought used like 200,000 miles on it and 10 years old, but the thing was a tank. And uh, so he's like, oh uh, yeah, sure. It's a three hour round trip, but uh -huh. so that's what happens. He picks me up, I make it home. We pull up next to our house at 11.58 p.m. And on the dashboard, the thermometer turns over to 32 degrees and it started to snow. Oh, man. And I was like, holy shit. So the next day, I'm unpacking. I get my phone. I kind of look around. I'm like, I sent her a text just to say thank you. Like, hey, listen, I really appreciated that. You did, in fact, get me home last night. I mean, I frankly couldn't believe it. I really appreciated it. It's almost like you're psychic or something. And she takes a second to reply, and then she goes, oh, ha, 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 funny you should say that. Um, that's actually my side hustle. I've worked with a Houston PD for nearly 20 years, and I've helped them close nearly two dozen cases. Oh, my God. Oh, how cool. There you go. And I was, like, you I was like, you understand. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, oh, I know what you do, and God bless. I Have fun, Katie. And now this was an older woman who was re retired partially and living, I, I think she actually lived in Dallas, but I could be wrong. I mean, obviously I changed everything except for the premise of a psychic travel agent. But kind of all of that stuff sort of catamari together. And I was like, you know what? I, th I think I can do this. And, uh, and, and the rest was history. It's such a fun book. And uh, my work has been super, super busy. We are right in the middle of budgeting for next year. And because I am the only writer for one entire feature pillar that collects a bunch of stuff, 
I have to sit in on these meetings and say things like, hey, remember, there's only one of me. Y'all have to Thunderdome and figure out who gets what. So I, I have been- Fight for my attention. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. And I, I have them all trained that they, they want my benevolent attention because I have been sending disapproving gifts to people who don't give me plans. But so, but so there's been like these past three weeks of just insanity. So I was like, I have Sherry's book. I should read this. And I lay there on the couch with, you know, Miss Elizabeth No Biting, 20 pound tabby cat sitting on me and cackling maniacally. And so my husband, Pete, is occasionally like, what are you doing? I'm reading Sherry's new book that's not out yet. And he's like, oh God, okay. <laughs> Tell her hi. I'll take it. Hi, Pete. <laughs> so Pete's like, hi. But so, yeah, and it was just, it was so much fun. And, and congratulations, you will understand what this means. I took a break from reading fanfic to read your book. Right? I've read like three new, new books this year. And that's, <laughs> it. that's about where I am. Honestly. <laughs> yeah. So when, when I was cackling, he was like, what, what Hannibal fanfic are you reading now? And I'm like, I'm reading Sherry's book. So <laughs> I got that opening joke from a travel agent, actually, when, when I was, they rerouted me. It's, so there, you can get a direct flight out of Chattanooga to like four places. You can go to Detroit, Chicago, Charlotte, Orlando, Sanford, not Orlando International, but Orlando, right. Sanford, and Houston, and, and Atlanta, obviously. It's literally an eight-minute flight to Atlanta, <laughs> but um, it's almost not worth the trouble. You go up, you go down, you're in Atlanta. Flying to Portland takes longer. Yeah, well, but the problem is, so Hartsfield will offload their scheduling issues on the little regional airport. And so I always left myself at least two hours because we never left on time mm -hmm. because, well, they didn't have a gate at Hartsfield yet. So you got to stay here because, again, it was an eight minute flight. Right. <laughs> like, no, no, no. Y'all can wait. So but no, I they rerouted me once. I had a, it was out of Detroit. I'd done Confusion out in Michigan. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, I love them. It's my favorite event. And I was coming back and my as often as not, the puddle jumper flight gets canceled for lack of interest between yeah. Atlanta and Chattanooga. How many people do you think are flying from Atlanta to Chattanooga? But uh, so I'm, I'm in the airport and, and this woman's like, okay, so here's your new ticket. Clickety, clickety, click, click, click. Because I'm at the desk. Uh, and, and I'm like, ah, oh, now I got to stop in Atlanta. And she doesn't even look up. She keeps on typing and she goes, sweetheart, you are in the South. If you die and go to hell, you got to stop in Atlanta first. And I was like, Thank you for this gift that you have given me. <laughs> I'm going to use that joke somewhere. Somewhere. So it basically opens grave reservations. But uh, yeah, that's that's my favorite travel joke. Told to me by a bored flight attendant <laughs> at a register, and I will love her forever for it. That is so awesome. That is so <laughs> awesome. Yeah, but like it's always it's one of those things. It's always like people will have questions about something, but it's always the weird, silly shit that is true. Oh you yeah, know, yeah, like, absolutely. There's a lot of weird, silly shit that's true in Grave Reservations, and I, I had to occasionally explain to the editor or the copy editor, like, no, that's that's a thing. It's just it's what they do here. It's fine. <laughs> oh, trying trying to explain any any Seattle behavior to people who are not in this city is is you know, a thing. I mean, it's I mean, I know it's the everywhere. case with every everywhere, but yeah. but having grown up in Seattle, yeah, I am I am well aware of our weirdness. Mm -hmm. Weird. I met up with We're a, from the a southeast, so <laughs> I met up with a friend recently, and she's from the East Coast. She lived in Manhattan, but she also lived in Boston. And she was like, "Can I vent about Seattle drivers to you?" And I'm like, "Oh yes, you can." There's a reason I don't drive. I I oh am a native, God. therefore I should not drive, and I know that. Oh my God, my new favorite hate for Seattle drivers. <laughs> We've known for years that they cannot make a zipper. Like a yep. zipper is an unknown concept for merging in the greater Seattle area. But a thing that I've noticed living here this time, because we moved here in 2006, left in 2012, came back came four, back. Years, four right. years ago. So the first time we lived here, I noticed the zipper thing. But the new thing when there's construction, when you've got to merge a lane because of construction or whatever. Listen, I try to be polite. I leave two car lengths so that so you can make a zipper. <laughs> and let people in and everything moves smoother. I can't, ah, geez, sorry. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> she reached up and put a claw on the underside of my thigh. And, well, to, um, to let you know she's there. And why are you not paying attention? Hi, baby. Yes. Sorry. She's a large, strong cat. And when she surprises you, 
boop. Uh, no, anyway, so the thing they do is, so I leave room and the other car will be a little bit ahead of me and I'll be like, come on, come on, go on, get in, get in, smash, flash your headlights, come on, you see me, get in, get, get in, get, there are now three car lengths in front of me and you have about 20 yards before you stop or merge, 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 and I will let someone else in. And if someone else can come in behind me, it's just math work with me people but like i've literally had people like stop up against the barrier with with their turn signal on trying to merge and not merge in front of me and i was trying to tell my husband about it, it was i was like no it's been driving me crazy lately and i was driving him uh back from a doctor's appointment and i was like no you watch it's gonna happen it's gonna ha and it did he's like holy shit i've never noticed this and it's infuriating yes yes it is I'm trying to be polite and you're ignoring me. Construction <laughs> confuses us. We are simple people. <laughs> They'll drive straight into the sign that says, you you know, this is it. This is the end of the line. Rather when, than... When seasons change, Seattleites get confused. There's a giant glowing orb in the sky. What does that mean? God is angry. There's water coming from the sky. What does that mean? So, That's yeah. normal. I'm going to so, for the summer. I mean, well, but, I mean, mm. so, yeah, you know, I'm a chronic <laughs> insomniac and I grew up in Seattle. Therefore, I should not drive. I should not be mm -hmm. operating a motor vehicle. I am at the mercy Fair. of my friends and family. But I got comfortable driving around Nashville, which frankly is worse than L.A. in my experience. I've driven pretty much everywhere. And I would rather drive in LA than drive in Nashville. And Seattle is like third or fourth place after that, to be Dang. perfectly honest. It's, it's bad. So what uh, are some other things you had to explain to your to your editor and your copy editor about, no, really, that's just how oh, it is. And, and, uh, well, mostly it was just kind of fiddly stuff, like uh, the idea of somebody being kind of a freelance writer who's a job hopper. Oh. And, and that... it's like, you know, that's a thing. Like, like, it's not weird at all. Everybody has worked at Amazon for a year. <laughs> like, I haven't. Okay. I escaped Amazon. I didn't. So many people. Microsoft. <sighs> okay, fine. Say okay, one uh, of these. Yeah. Everybody has worked for at least a year at one of the big ones. And then you get a little few stock options. You get it on your resume. People stay where people go. But uh, one of the characters, uh, one of the suspects has kind of a sketchy job history of hopping from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. And they thought that was immediately suspicious. I'm like, it's really not. That's, that's a really normal thing out here, especially for uh, millennials, for lack of a better term. Because the people in this book are mostly in their 30s. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm 46, so I was writing down a little bit, but I, I feel like I have a you know, context and observation to kind of, and, and I have some younger friends, so I'm just kind of watching this. But, um, and I did, I, I've written for Amazon, I freelanced for them. I freelanced, um, I mean, I got my start working for the company that did the online warehousing for Sears. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I got my start uh, porting the Sears wish book and the craftsman catalog to the internet. The wish book. I was, the Sher I was Sherry the tool girl. I didn't do the whole wish book, but I did do the whole craftsman catalog every year. And so when I ended up here and, and I was looking into free re freelance writing at the time, and this was 15 years ago, it would have been 2007 maybe. Um, at the time, they had a new tool guy on Amazon who was looking for somebody, and bless him, he, he was a younger guy, younger, younger than me probably, who knew nothing about tools, and they had just put him into tools, and I'm like, I have written about tools for four years, I, I got this, well, there's all these weird standards, I know, I set most of them, because I managed the Craftsman catalog for four years, so I've, I've got this man, so I worked for him for about a year and a half, and then he ended up uh, either being fired or moved to another department, I'm not sure what, and, they, and whoever replaced them had their own freelancers, it's fine, but everybody kind of like, well, you work here a year, you put it on your resume, and you move forward, and mm -hmm. do other stuff, and um, but, but little things like that, just kind of like about the general culture. Oh, and I remember at the end, they were like, this just sounds very filthy for a downtown area. Because I was describing Cap Hill in the rain on a weekend. And they you... were like, this just sounds a little bit offensive. And I'm like, I lived there for six years. <laughs> you made it slightly cleaner than I, than I so. remember. I, so. I, didn't, I left out the dead rats. Right. I, you know, I, right. I included the cool drag queens who play baseball at the field, you know, yes. like yes. included the fun stuff. But at the end, where like the guy is face down after he's been uh, the, the bad guy in the broad sense uh, is being arrested and, and he's like lying down and, and all the stuff's running past his head in the gutter. Uh, the, the copy editor or somebody was like, I don't, I don't know if this is a good idea. This sounds terrible. This can't possibly be. Seattle's a, it's a wealthy city. You know, I'm sure they take better. Mm. Oh, honey, no. <laughs> Infrastructure, uh, what is that? 
infrastructure. It's like I left out, I think, the needles. and. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I need for you to understand this is actually what it looks and feels and smells like. And, uh, so, so which bar, which club did you base the, uh, the karaoke bar on? Well, I didn't actually base it on any of them. It, in my head, it's loosely where Unicorn is on Capitol. Okay, okay. Uh, I was kind of thinking, I didn't want to lift that too directly, not least of all because I don't live on Capitol anymore and I hadn't been there in years. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought, well, we'll put it around there. It's not too far from the Merc, you know, and there's yeah. a bunch of stuff right there on the pipeline corridor. Yeah. And um, it, it, it you know, seemed like a good idea. Yeah, I spent but, I spent a couple minutes like, where is this? Where is this in my mental map of Capitol Hill? Which, and I know my references for Cap Hill are like mm -hmm. ten to fifteen years out of date because I haven't been there in ages. Oh my god, mine too, dude. When we first moved back and we went to the Merc, you know, the golf bar. Go to the golf basement. bar. You go to the golf bar um, on Halloween. It's like the people who only go to church on Christmas and Easter on Halloween. We all go to the golf bar. But my husband had had been more recently than I had because he used to come back out here more often than I did. Mm -hmm. And he kept saying, oh, oh, hang on. I think she's about to hop up into my lap here. We'll see. And um, I, I, he, he kept saying, you'll recognize where we are in a minute. You'll, you'll realize in a minute where we are. We parked and got out and walked up to that alley, and I didn't know where the hell we were. I was like, I don't recognize any of this. And we were only gone for five years. So we the come back and nothing looked familiar. The company I work for, our offices are downtown, right right in that triangle, right where uh, you get off of Olive, where there's yeah. where the rebar used to be, all of this. Right, oh, and I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> okay, I can figure this out. I can, you know, I can get myself to the bus. That's fine. And then I'm like, no, I can't. This is completely, my mental <laughs> map is gone. I cannot navigate downtown whatsoever. I mean, to the point where I'm like, okay, I will open Google Maps and I will have it give me step by step where I am going to get to this bus stop because I don't recognize anything anymore. And it was weird. I literally do that. And it, it was well, super and weird. Fair, like we lived on the north end the first time we were here. Now we're kind of in the south central end. Right. And so I'm learning my way around from the south. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to wrap your ear. Um, from the south side rather than the north side. So I'm still even at, sorry, this is my life. These are my choices. Yes. <laughs> you have a house panther. Yes. Yes. Are you the house leopard? Boop. She's really very sweet. and She's soft like a bunny. But um, what she wants, she wants, and she wants it right now. And uh, this little lord, who again was found in an engine block covered with grease, uh, will only accept certain kinds of food, certain kinds of petting. Like she's just. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. You're a princess, aren't you? Now, anyway, so uh, I, I loosely said it on where Unicorn is, but. Um, I wanted it to be a themed bar that was in a carnival theme because unicorns a lot of fun. Oh my god, I have fried unicorn balls that are freaking delicious. Um, <laughs> she's like looking around over here, like do 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 do. <laughs> um, but uh, so Castaways is the name of a mid-century club in Vegas that oh. was uh, that went under. I want to say in the eighties, but I could be wrong. And so I thought, well, okay, we'll do like a Vegas mid-century themed bar kind of in that same location about that same size and shape that's roughly what I wanted and so that's kind of loosely where it is sort of a couple blocks from Elliott Bay and from okay. Cal Anderson but I, I realize it's a little vague I still forget Elliott Bay is on the hill now because in my yeah, mental map it it's down in Pioneer Square down, yeah yeah that's where it was um and and uh I used to know some people who worked there and everything and then they moved it to the new location. I don't know anybody anymore. And um, I love the new building. It's really cool. So I'm going to, I'm going to totally date myself here. The reason I have the mental map of Elliott Bay being down in Pioneer Square is because when the Camarilla, the vampire live action role-playing group got its start it here in Seattle, that's where we met every week. There, oh. was, there was a room off the cafe that you could sign up for. Yes. I used to eat lunch there when I was, I was part of like a writing, uh, uh, like a, a sharecropping situation at one point downtown. You know what I mean? Oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Give you 15 bucks an hour to do work that they get paid $400 an hour for. That kind of yes, thing. yes. But, but yeah, I would go down there and I know it's the same thing. Yeah. So yeah, you know, it was, the, it was the room right off the cafe where it was all, you know, it had bookshelves and everything. But with yes. the bricks and everything. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where the uh, Seattle Vampire Court held Elysium every Saturday night. We held ours at the Grand Ole Opry Hotel in Nashville. Well, the hell with you. Well, no, the great thing is it's so huge. It, I have heard, and I do not know for a fact this is true, but it wouldn't surprise me that they have their own zip codes. It's literally the size of a small town. Well, and there's like, 
15, 20 entrances. And we would pick one of the lobbies and there'd be like 45, 50 people because it's the Southeast. And so, so White Wolf is based out of Atlanta. So all the Atlanta guys would come up for it. And we'd get the Birmingham. So from Chattanooga, you're two hours from Knoxville, Nashville, Atlanta, um, Birmingham, Huntsville, and everybody would oh, come man. in on the weekends for these big games. So now Nashville was another two hours for a lot of these people, but at least once a month, everybody would come out for them. Mm-hmm. And we would just dress up and hang out and play in one of the lot. Nobody ever said shit to us. I couldn't oh my God. believe it. Like the place was so huge. You just kind of, if somebody, if a security kind of started looking at you a little funny, well, you just went to another lobby. You go find some of the restaurants in the center. There is a river running through it with gondolas and shit. I'm not even kidding. Oh, so like the Venetian in Vegas. Basically, but imagine an entire two or three city blocks of Vegas in one country themed building. That's kind of amazing. It's amazing. It's that's, huge. But yeah, that's, yeah, that's that's where we ran all our vampire games. Either that or yeah. the Hapeville Recreational Center in Atlanta. That's where all the white uh, the white wolf people went. <laughs> the white yeah. today. <laughs> I I knew all the white wolf people back in the day. So yeah, I would occasionally get shipped down there by Wizards of the Coast and, and hang out with them and go to their games and be like, Yeah, but I remember not, I remember number 39 in Seattle Camarilla. What are I mean, you guys just wrote the game, whatever. Dude, so. I I played, I called her my Toria horror. I was mostly just in it for the clothes. Right. Um, and I I just low-key played for like two or three years and I did the Birmingham game, the Nashville game, the Atlanta game. Was I was in grad school working three jobs. I got my kicks where I could take them. Hell yeah. And I lit, my roommate was a CST for the local chapters. So for like two years, I'm doing, you know, three or four games a weekend or, or a, a month. And uh, then they got to the big coup attempt in Atlanta once where everybody was going to oust Prince Vlad. And I was there and they just thought I was some slutty courtesan because that's how I dressed in the late 90s. It's what you do. Yeah. And um, <laughs> as you do. And uh, somebody came at me about something like, oh, well, let's just scrape these, the, the low levels out of the way. And it's like, oh, sweetie, ma- we're going to go. And I was like, um, majesty, walk, the, walk away. And literally everybody, because I know some places it's, it's this and some places, you know, like there's lots of different signs. There's different hand signs, yeah. Yeah. And everybody freezes and I'm like, here's my sheet. <laughs> but don't you don't want to <laughs> yeah yeah this character is so much higher power than she thinks she is and is, uh oh good time oh, god that was probably 99 or 2000 maybe there a is a on one of the social medias there is a camarilla memories group basically <laughs> and people are like popping up posting stuff from the old old days like some of the original pamphlets and things that pe- that the houses may oh, yeah. send out to people and photos from the old days and it's just it's been amazing and it's also been like oh god did the passage of time i can't i thought i couldn't <laughs> cope when i you know my god kid turned 16 <laughs> but now i'm like that was how long ago well oh. okay i mm. think the outfit has finally come out of my hair but don't quote me on that i'm not entirely sure so eh. no that was that was a oh man that was a great time if I, I could get, get someone to run, I mean, okay, this was pre-COVID, so, you know, when we could all still get together. If someone had said, yeah, I'll run a troop LARPing game with, like, a small handful of people, I would have done it. The reason mm-hmm. I wouldn't go back to the main Camarillo is because they wisely still enforce the no-touching rule, which is good, but that meant I wouldn't be able to punch pe- certain people in the face when they broke the no-touching rule. So I was like, mm-hmm. let's just, let's remove that temptation from me. That's a mm-hmm. bad plan. No, I understand. Uh, the, the first game I ever did in Atlanta, actually, and I promise I'll, I'll stop talking about it. Because, like, we'll talk about, like, our character sheets all freaking day. But, um, no, the Buy something, then tell Atlanta, me about your character. Yes. Um, but the, she's melted off my lap and she's hanging out over the floor. It's really very funny, but I don't want to disturb her. No, uh, the first one I ever did, I was dragged down there by uh, uh, our, our Chattanooga group. And... Uh, it's in the basement of the Hapeville Recreational Center. It's, it's the YMCA. It is but the classic the, experience. It was. But for in Atlanta, where White Wolf was, I mean, these games would have a couple hundred people every time. And so the first one I ever did, I'm coming in. They're going to present me to court with uh, the sheriff of the China Court, like you do. And I come up, and the prince comes out. It was Tim Clancy. I don't know if you knew him. <gasps> it was Tim Clancy. So he comes out. He comes up to the throne and he starts walking towards me really slowly. And with every step, boom, boom, 
boom. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, they've got like special effects and shit here. No, someone was playing basketball upstairs and he was timing his steps. Nice. Who was the person dribbling? And it was echoing downstairs for the rest of us. I'm like, this guy's good. Holy shit. That, okay. That's, that was awesome. I loved him. But that know. is that, well done. Well played, sir, is what yes. I say. So we've got, I mean, we got like 10 minutes. Yeah. So let's, let's see what's in the Q and a. So, aha. Uh, just wondering with November coming soon, do either of you find things like NaNoWriMo to be helpful to your writing? No, I, I do not touch NaNoWriMo at all because I, I can work with artificially imposed deadlines for day jobs. Um, but working for artificially imposed deadlines for my actual personal writing, I, no. I can't do it and I freak out. The closest I come to doing an artificially imposed deadline is a specific annual fanfic challenge for rare fandoms and that's it. Now, um, I usually don't either, honestly, but it's, it's like, I understand the structure is very helpful for some people, but traditionally for me, uh, November is a production month for me. Like right now, speaking of, wait, wait, Great reservation. <laughs> um, I, I handed in the sequel uh, a few weeks ago and I got my rewrites on that. And I, honestly, they were I'm so excited because like kind of for your second book with the same team, you sort of get a feel for what people are looking for and what to avoid and what the, you know, I'm a quick learner and quick study. Um, so the, the sequel, the, uh, the, the working title is Flight Risk because we're going with travel puns. As you should. As, you as should. we should. As we should. Uh, well, the original working title of uh, Grave Reservations was Farfetched, actually. We went ahead and named it for her thing. She calls it Lita Foley's Farfetched Flights of Fancy, and that's the name of her business. Um, Which I loved. I thought it was fun, but yeah, they, 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 they changed it because they were like, look, with a hyphen, sometimes it's hard for people to search oh, uh, yeah, in, yeah. in catalogs and stuff, and it, sometimes it's even hard for booksellers, and, and so it's like, oh, yeah, okay. So, like, so we need a new title, something fun. We brainstormed for probably four or five days between me and my editor and my agent. Oh, wow. Just throwing stuff back and forth. Like, uh, here are some keywords. Anybody got any good phrases that work with that? And then I was sitting out on our deck. Uh, I don't remember why. It was, it was late in spring, I want to say. And I, it's just, it's a great reservation. It's, 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 it's murder. It's a little funny. And if this does go to series, the series lead is going to be the booking agent. Because she books travel, he books crooks. Yep. They're the, yep. They're, the they're the booking agents. Uh, so so uh, so I don't get to do Nano Remo even if I wanted to because my deadline is the end of November. So I got to do the rewrites on that, and uh, I'm developing a new project. I just took a writer field trip with my friend Kat Richardson to a secret island, and uh, I'm gonna do a straight gothic. I decided I was just gonna do a paint by numbers. I wanted I got to do a southern gothic before I left Tennessee. I did uh, the family plot in the toll. Like I, I did a haunted house, Southern Gothic, and I did a straight weird Southern Gothic. Yes. I'm gonna do a Pacific Northwest one. And I have my setting, I have, I, I have my hook. But the, it, when I was looking for the setting, because the setting is you know, extremely important in one of these, I uh, started, I literally was just like on Google Maps, like, I don't know what's around here. Because you need some place that can be isolated without a lot of contrivance. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be one of those, oh, no, the phone isn't working. You know, I, I make a point never to do that. Like, uh, is there a credible reason why this place could be easily isolated? Mm -hmm. Well, we got a shit ton of little tiny islands. Oh, yeah, we do. And I found one. Fewer than a thousand people live on it. It's not incorporated. There are no towns, no connection to the mainland and no ferries. You can only get to it via a causeway from another island that actually has a connection to the mm -hmm. mainland. Um, it's a couple, as the crow flies, it's not 60 miles from here, but it's Seattle. And you can either right. take a ferry to uh, Port Orchard mm -hmm. and then drive another you know, 20 miles or 30 miles or however far it is. And, or you could drive around the South Sound. And because I'm on Beacon Hill, I'm like, screw it, I'm just going to drive. The ferries have been kind of jacked up lately anyway. And uh, Kat lives out that way, so at Bremerton. So I, I just swung by and picked her up and we did yeah. a writer field trip. Nice. Yeah. So you're writing a straight up Gothic, huh? Mm-hmm. So when I am you need, hype about it. <laughs> when you need a beta reader, I'm just oh, saying. Oh, yeah. No, you are. I, I am here. I am right here. You're, when we are not on a time limit for this kind of thing. Oh, now we'll just tell you the name of the island. And some of the locals may even be familiar with it. Just because I wasn't. It was new to me. And I felt like the geography gods had given me this gift. 
So it's, it's, it's around World War II, there was this thing called the Triangle of Fire because America, oh, yeah, yeah. Was, America was a little afraid that Japan was going to try and launch something. So at the entrance of Puget Sound, at the edge of San Juan, they, there are three military bases aimed at yes. specifically the sound. So on this island, a bunch of shit had been set up in, for World War I that never got used. So they went back and redid it. And it's where Fort Flagler is now, which is weird to me because I always associate Flagler with Florida, but different Flagler, I guess. Um, so then this, this island's name is six square miles in the middle of nowhere. And it has one inlet on the map and it's called Mystery Bay, for God's yes, sake. Yes. Like if I made it up, no one would believe me. It's called Marrowstone because George Vancouver in 1782 or whatever was like, this ground is hard and red and I can build nothing. Mm. So he named it, <laughs> basically what happened. So he named it Marrowstone. I'm like, Jesus Christ, if I made that up, nobody would believe me. That's awesome. So That's it's set awesome. on Marrowstone and oh, it's got all, oh, I got a house. I got intrigue. I have weird sexual tension. Yes. <laughs> like, I am all about this. I'm just like yes. just straight up Pacific yes. Northwest stuff. Put this That's in my eyes. Thing. Put this in my eyes. I'm, I'm so hyped about it. But first, first, I got to do the rewrites on flight risk. So yes, that's where we are so, right now. We have a second question, and it's Vilda Velda. I'm going to mispronounce your name because my <laughs> grandmother's name was Vida, so I default to that. But uh, also wondering, I've met, seen the odd joke about authors taking mean people they've met and using them as a template for someone they kill off in their work. Have either of you ever done that? I mean, so in the the book I wrote that was not published that I got incredibly kind rejection letters for my my agent was like I don't know why they're rejecting this but so I put I put the entire thing up on my patreon and the thing is there is a version one of it that is a lot I mean it's a it's a YA but the version one was a lot darker to where my my agent was like yeah I can I can see where you grew up in the horror genre girl and mm -hmm. the one of the main bad guys is kind of based oh. on someone I used to know and and yeah mm -hmm. and and my agent was like okay this is a little too creepy and a little too dark and please don't tell me this particular character is based off a real person and I'm like I, mm -hmm. I won't tell you that okay I and can... if you don't know that's plausible deniability exactly exactly because yeah it was one of those things mm -hmm. um I know other authors who do that um I have a couple I have a couple friend other friends who are authors who are like I'm like don't get on their bad side man you will you will die horribly well, I think it was Anne Lamont who said uh, if people get mad that you write about them uh don't worry about it they should have just been better people when they were around you it's on the that was the thrust of her quote but it's it's kind of like getting songs written about you you know there kind of. there are like three different ways you'll get a song written about you and like one of them is good but generally on the whole it's either you are an object of pining or you broke someone's heart yeah well in in my earliest books actually i i just wrote some friends into them because i knew it i broke into publishing i think i was 22 23 i was real young this was more than 20 years ago and I was, I was still kind of getting some of those newbie habits out, mm -hmm. you know, because I had been very, very sheltered for a long time. And uh, I wrote a couple of friends then. And in one of my earlier books, there's a guy named Jamie who uh, it was a direct lift of a dude I know. And that's not his name, but that's close enough to his name. His ex-girlfriend wrote me after reading the book. and was like, why don't you just put a map to his house in the back? <laughs> Everybody knows who this is. And I'm like, but it's there not are... like a negative portrayal it's a fun character and everybody likes them there is a mage the ascension novel that if you know if people have read white wolf fiction and they have read this they will come up to me at conventions oh yeah well no and i wrote um a novella that had a, a parody of you in it you and liana renee heber and uh tambriel and uh God, there's a handful of other people i included uh shep who's for, who i've known for years and years before they transitioned and 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 just like a bunch of people, I knew, it, was, it was friend fanfic, is what it was. Oh yeah. And well, the, well, no, the funny thing is, when I was shopping for a new agent a couple years ago, I had a file I called Agent Bait, <laughs> and it was like it was like all my own. It, it was all the stuff that that previously uh, no one had bothered to look at mm -hmm. uh, that I've been working on, and I included that because specifically I already knew it wasn't going to sell. 
and I was using it as a litmus test. So I talked to, I, I had my top three agents that I really wanted to talk to. And one of them was very, oh, this, I think it's brilliant. I think it's really, really good. And I'm thinking, no, I've already talked to all the markets that would buy this. I know it's not going to sell. And then one of them, one of them was like, you under, this is, uh, it's great, but we would have to do some rewrites. And I'm thinking, no. And the agent I went with went, you understand this is never going to sell. And I was like, you, you're the one. You're, you're the, the one I want. One. You're, you're the one. one. But no, I wrote, in, I wrote in Jillian some other friends, it's these three sisters. And I was playing with the old um, Who Put Bella in the Witch Elm story from the UK in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. but, but it is very, it's very low key and talky and personal and expository. Mm -hmm. And I understand why. It's, I, like, I am aware of why it won't sell, but right. I'm absolutely going to cannibalize it for other stuff. Well, as you should, as you totally should. But, but I talked to everybody before I did that, which I do yeah. feel like, like I, I, I want everybody to be okay with the fact that I have written you into this thing that has never sold and is basically friend fanfic. Do we all I, understand I that? remember you asking me about that. <laughs> so much fun. Well, hi, welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> hi, I'm so sorry to crash the party. No, it's okay. <laughs> so as much as I would love to just hang out and chat all for the rest of the night, Unfortunately, we are at the end of our evening together. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm just going to take this last few moments to say a huge thank you for being here, for sharing all of these wonderful stories. Uh, Sorry, it has been such a, a delight. <laughs> and your, your beautiful pets, gigantic oh, kitty friend. I'm obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> um, audience members, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, we are so, so happy to have you here. Always, always. For anyone who would like to get your hands on copies of Grave, Grave Reservations, uh, I'm going to just relink the, uh, the book in chat. We've had a lot of conversations <laughs> since then. So there it is. There's your button to go track that down. And I will come out and find stock. I, I do not know exactly when I'm going to try to do it next week. I've had a month over here and we had our neighbor's tree fall on our house a couple days ago and we're still navigating all of that during the day and all of that cleanup. But I, I intend to, and also I'm much closer actually to your Ravenna location over at Seward Park. Great. So I'm going to hit them first, pro probably, to be honest, because you guys are like an hour away from me, nothing personal. Yeah, totally. Nothing, but, you know, when I was in Cap Hill, you guys were a lot closer and I was there all the time. <laughs> but uh, now it's a, it's a little bit of a hike and I'm happy to do it. Uh, but well, we will see you soon. Next, not, next, week, next week, next week. There you go. Wonderful. Okay. So yeah, audience, keep an eye out for that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. No, thank um, you for hosting this. Really, you've been yes, an amazing thank you. host, and your organization <laughs> has been fantastic. It is absolutely our pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> so one more huge, huge thank you, Sherry and Jillian, for being here. And I think that this is the point where we all awkwardly wave. So. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Thank everybody. You. Thanks again. <laughs>